Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 148 and the Glaucoma Session 52. And welcome to the International Masterclass Series Continued. Today we have with us Professor Andre Momod, and he'll be talking on I Watch the Deep Sclerectomies. And uh, I request Dr. Vanita Ma'am to please introduce him. Thank you very much, Rolika. Uh, thanks once again. And very sadly, we have to say this is one of the last in the International Masterclass Series in Glaucoma, but we have a very, very special guest. And Team Center for Sight has the good fortune yet again to bring you another glaucoma specialist renowned worldwide, this time for innovative work in glaucoma surgery. And of course, as usual, it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to our ophthalmologist in training. Professor Andre Mahmood is a surgeon and innovator par excellence. I have absolutely no res reservations in saying this. He has been instrumental in non-penetrating glaucoma surgeries and has been the front runner in the research in this field. And now he's leading a team to do stellar work in an adjustable glaucoma drainage device called iWatch. And we have the good fortune to interact with him personally uh, related to both these procedures. And like many of our recent international uh, guests uh, in the glaucoma module, he too has featured in the top 100 uh, influential ophthalmologists in the ophthalmologists. Um, uh, Professor Henri Momu is the medical director at the Swiss Vision Network in Lausanne, where he has been instrumental in creating the department, uh, has been a, an associate professor at the Jules Gonin Eye Hospital at the University of Lausanne. Uh, which he held till 2007. He's also been a visiting professor at a Christian Medical College, um, Valor, in India. He completed his research fellowship in glaucoma and uveitis at the Doheny Eye Institute, uh, California. And prior to that, he's also done a fellowship in glaucoma at Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, he, uh, uh, of course, finished his ophthalmology training uh, at uh, Lausanne in uh, Switzerland. Um, he has delivered several national, international uh, lectures. He has been a visiting professor and is um, a, a renowned worldwide for his uh, peer reviewed publications on the procedures that we have yeah. just talked about and many, many others. So we extend a very warm welcome to Professor Andre Mahmoud to um, uh, give us his account of non penetrating glaucoma surgeries as well as eye watch. I believe you will start with eye watch first. Professor Mahmoud. Okay, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, this is a very special lecture today because I'm actually in a restaurant on the seashore of Cameroon in Africa. Wow. And now also, I'm also um, actually president of Vision for All Foundation, which is a foundation working worldwide to help um, uh, ophthalmology in developing countries. And uh, so now I'm visiting for that purpose uh, Cameroon. And I just want to show you I mean, where I'm here. I'm in this restaurant on the sea. You can see behind me beautiful sea with the boats. I don't know if you can see. But yes. I mean, it's a nice Wonderful. place. And uh, uh, so it's the first time in my life that I'm giving a conference in a restaurant first. <laughs> and on the floor. Uh, I will just quit the department to come and have some lunch uh, with my colleagues here. So my first lecture will uh, be done on uh, the iWatch system. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share the screen, but um, let me just go to my conference. So the first will be done on iWatch. I try to get my slide on. I hope you can see. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now it should be okay. 
Um, do you see my slides? Yes. So okay. um, the iWatch system is actually the first device which can control uh, the outflow of aqueous after glaucoma surgery. And uh, that has been developed in uh, our uh, technical institute in Lausanne since about 10 years. And uh, I will just show you how it works and uh, what are the advantage of such a device uh, in our glaucoma surgery arm, uh, arm munition, if I can say. Uh, if we look at the studies, and this is a major study which was published already more than 20 years ago uh, on drainage devices. And one of the key points was that glaucoma drainage devices would be more used if they would not have all those complications. And that's the major drawback of glaucoma drainage devices is that they are followed by many uh, complications. In the same article, it's written that existing glaucoma drainage device, and at that time it was the, basically the Maltino and the Barfeld, all exhibit problems with poor flow control. And now that's another study called the TVT study, an important study comparing the results of trabeculectomy versus tubes. And you can see that in this study, uh, the tube surgery, which are mainly Barfeld tube, had a qualified success of 60%, a complete success of about 15%, which is not that great. And trabeculectomy was slightly better with 70% qualified success and 50% complete success. But if you look at the complication rate, you can see that the trabeculectomy has about 33% of a complication and the tubes 20%. And this is still a lot of complication if you think that if you do cataract surgery or even retina surgery, you never face so many complications than glaucoma surgery. The main problem with tube surgery uh, is that it, uh, it requires early post-op flow restrictor, such as the tube ligature or a tube stent or putting a suture like a um, a proline suture inside the tube to reduce the, the, the flow through the tube. And then this needs usually a reintervention to reopen the flow once there is some resistance built in the orbital space. Hypotony may even persist even after all this very careful manipulation. And definitely we can say that there is no predictability in tube surgery even with the Ahmed tube, where is, it's supposed to have a valve system, actually it's not a valve, just a restricting system also. And once the so-called valve is opening, then the pressure comes down. And I was the first doctor to put an Ahmed tube in India, that was uh, 30 years ago in Velour Hospital. And all cases we implanted actually at hypotony because they were nervous glaucoma with very high preoperative pressure. So we have the same problem. And so uh, this is the main problem is the pressure control after the surgery. And the second complication actually is the high rate of corneal damages because the tube is quite big, is flexible and can touch the corneal endothelium and then we get endothelium decompensation. So what is the solution? I don't think there is any good solution or perfect solution, but there are better solutions. And the eyewash aims in that sense. Um, it's like a water tab where you can regulate the outflow after the surgery during the first post-operative month. That is the most difficult time after surgery. So it's, it's built with a, what we call the eyewash. I hope you see my arrow here. This is the eye wash with a little nozzle going into the anterior chamber. I will show you what is inside this device. And this is connected to a tube and then a plate. Uh, the eye wash is a system where the, like the water can, can regulate and open and close it to have a good regulation. How do we do that? Well, we have the eye watch pen, which as you can see on the right side. And there is a compass telling you what is the opening of the system? And then on the other side, you have a magnet where you can actually 
turn the, the wheel to open and close the system. So by, with this iPen, it's very easy to regulate your patient's outflow system. So is it an ideal solution? Well, maybe it's an approach to an ideal solution because the iWatch has a regulation for the flow resistance and this will avoid definitely hypotony and post of pressure control is much better. The nozzle is much smaller than any other tubes and it's rigid. By this, uh, this will probably theoretically should be much safer for the endothelium of the cornea and uh, will avoid some of the uh, corneal decompensation. And uh, finally, the, the plate is uh, designed with a different shape compared to Ahmed and uh, the Barfeld plate. Uh, probably you know that with the Barfeld, especially the Barfeld, which has very large like wings on either side, we have a lot of uh, strabismus problem postoperatively. So in order to try to reduce this strabismus complication, we designed a much longer shaped plate, uh, but the, the surface is still 200 or 300 millimeters square. So how is the was done inside? Now we have opened the, and the, like the, the plate and inside is a wheel. And you can see here, that is the nozzle. Then there's a small tube in silicone, very thin, which can be deformed. It goes around the wheel here and then it comes out in the back portion. This wheel has a particularity, it's asymmetric. So this radius is bigger than this radius. So whenever you turn the wheel, then the wheel will come and crash the tube and close the tube. And by doing this, you can reduce the outflow uh, and doing the opposite, turning anti-clockwise, then you can, uh, turning like this, you can open and then the tube will open and then the flow will be much more important. This is just to compare the plates, the Ahmed first, which is 184 millimeters squared. The Barfel is very large and may in induce strabismus. And then the eye plate, which is much longer, 16.7 and 18.9 millimeter for the 200 and the 300 respectively. So here is a video explaining again. The iWatch system is the world's volume. first adjustable glaucoma drainage shunt. It is designed to drain aqueous humor efficiently while allowing for an atraumatic adjustment of intraocular pressure according to each patient's needs. The system consists of the iWatch flow adjustment device connected in series to the eye plate. The fluidic resistance of the iWatch device can be adjusted non-invasively by rotating its internal magnetic disc using an external control unit. The rotation of the magnetic disc around its eccentric axis allows for compression or decompression of the drainage tube, thus acting like an adjustable faucet. To implant the iWatch system, first implant the eye plate in a manner similar to other glaucoma drainage devices. Then create an opening to the anterior chamber using a 25 gauge needle. Insert the nozzle of the eye watch into the anterior chamber and secure the device in place using 10 zero sutures. Connect the tube of the eye plate to the outlet of the eye watch. Verify its secure connection by gently pulling on the tube. Place and suture a scleral patch over the device. Finish by closing the conjunctiva. Now I'm going to show you the real operation. And here you have a, a real eye. We have opened the conjunctiva, prepared the um, uh, orbital space. And now we are inserting the eye plate. This is a 200 eye plate, it's a small one. We are putting it um, below the two muscles. We are measuring it 12 millimeter. That should be at least 12 millimeters between the limbus and the, the plate uh, sutures to have enough space then uh, to put the eye watch system in the front part. The plate is fixed with two suture of, um, usually it's a pro lane, nine zero. Here we have uh, this little uh, house, I call it a house because it will 
allow me to actually dissect a space inside the sclera to be able to insert the eyewash system inside the sclera. So there will be no uh, big uh, um, like extrusion of the system and it will keep the, everything closed, you know, on, on a long-term basis. So usually we remove about half of the scleral thickness, which is about 500 micron. Here I put enter the maintainer. Now I do the entry with the needle to create this passage between outside and inside. We are inserting the eye watch, which will fit it in this hole. We're just checking with the gonioscopy to be sure that the eye watch is well positioned. I am putting two sutures to hold the system in place inside the sclera. The eye wash is measuring 500 micron, micron thickness. You are checking, it's totally open, it's at zero. I was going to turn clockwise and to close it because we want it to be closed at the beginning to avoid hypotony. Now we are measuring it six, so it's closed. Uh, if it's not precisely six, we can always change and reopen or close to be sure to be correct. Here I'm cutting the tube at the right length and then adjusting the tube to the eyewash system. The tube can be really well adjusted. And then I'm putting a tutoplast, which is a, a, a pericardium graph over the eyewash. It's the first thing I want to show you, and I'll show you a second one. This is the closure of the conjunctiva. I like to use, uh, open it about five millimeters from the limbus so the patient doesn't feel anything at the end of surgery. Here is a second case, uh, more recent in a more difficult patient who had several surgery for glaucoma and they all scarred down. So again, I'm opening about five, six millimeters from the limbus and with the suture at the end, patients usually don't feel anything because the suture is back, far back in, in, the, in, in the fornix. So here we have to prepare uh, the, the sclera, uh, uh, seeing the orbit and uh, putting a, a hook, a muscle hook to create the space. Now we're inserting again a 200 eye plate uh, between usually the superior rectus and the lateral rectus. I go as much as possible posteriorly to have enough space in the anterior part, as I said, at least 12 millimeters. In this case, you will see we have almost 15 millimeter. Those two sutures should be well fixed to avoid any movement uh, of the eye plate in the follow-up of the patient. So we're putting two sutures. Here I put 12 and you can see that it's more than 12. We have almost 15 millimeters between the limbus and the, the plate. Here I'm preparing the sclera to be very clean, and so removing the vessel. And then I'm going to use my little house to design the dissection to put my eye watch. So here there are some other surgeries before, so I'm trying to find the best place to insert my eye watch, so that it's a little bit oblique, not uh, uh, actually radial. And then same, I will cut about 50, uh, 500 micron, half a millimeter, since the eye watch thickness is 500 micron. And so that's a very, looks a bit difficult, it's not difficult at all actually. It's just a, a scleral dissection. There is no perforation. It's an easy uh, dissection. Actually, even I like to do that. It's uh, quite fun you know, to do this part. I'm using a crescent blade. We can keep a very stable, deep uh, surface, get that very nice plane like being the bed of the future eye watch. Uh, sometimes if you have a patient with high myopia, it might be a bit more difficult, but uh, this part of the surgery is not that difficult. What is difficult is this. Now we're putting the, the needle should be very nicely done because you have only one chance or two chance to do it. Uh, here is a small bleeding, for example, but if you are too much anterior, then it will be too long and it will be not possible to insert. If it's too short, it might bleed around. You can see here, there is some aqueous coming out from the posterior tube here. So it means it's connected. Usually at that stage, I take a gonioscope to just be sure that it's in the good place. Now I'm putting my suture. 
uh, with that angle that's going a bit anterior like this, this will, when we tie the suture, will really push the whole system towards the cornea, and that will make it watertight at the level, the anterior level here. So I'm putting those two sutures quite tight to, to have a total water tightness of the system. Now I'm uh, closing the system. It was 5.5, so a bit more to be on six. And now, yeah, I can see it's six. So I'm happy and I'm going now to connect the tube. So cutting it on the perfect length and then connecting it. This is some easy stuff, but there, there is a little movement of the tube. So I'm putting an extra suture to keep my tube right flash on uh, the sclera. So to avoid any uh, later conjunctival perforation. Here is comes the tutoplast. This is human pericardium, leophilized. And uh, so this is fixed with usually four nylon ten or sutures. And then the conjunctiva is closed with a, uh, a not a prolene, it's actually a vicryl 9O suture with a round body needle so we don't traumatize the conjunctiva. So it's, it's a surgery which takes about 45 minutes. And the patients are very happy because normally the, uh, the, 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 the next day there is no pain because the suture is quite posterior. And the uh, I just make a check here, uh, it's, and then we do a venoscopy, and we can see the eyewash in the angle goes through the trabeculum, which is the perfect side to go through. So we know that there will be no um, no damage done to uh, the endothelium. Uh, yeah, what I wanted to say also is that post operative patients are very happy because usually the visual acuity is not affected. Patients seeing six six before surgery we'll be we'll see six six the next day uh because basically we don't touch really the 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 axis i mean the actual visual axis we don't touch the cornea we don't touch uh, basically conjunctiva near the limbus so there is no astigmatism in use now this is the system to regulate the opening and closing of the system so as i told you this pen the eye pen on one side is a compass to know what is the opening and then you can use the right side here, the magnet, to turn clockwise to close, anti-clockwise to open. I will show you how it works on a it is zero. I'm going to turn clockwise to close it. And you can remeasure how it's 5.5. I want to reopen, we go anti-clockwise, and you will have about one or two, two. And then you can close it again. So and then you can see on the patient. On the, on the right side, we're doing it lively. The patient is looking usually down and nasally. So we are exposing the eye watch side and then we can turn gently. We don't actually even need to touch. We can touch a little bit the conch, but it's not needed. And then the semi is actually turning around like a clock. Uh, this is an example. This is a patient uh, with a high pressure. I'm sorry, I don't have the scale, but the pressure was 30 before surgery we did the operation and the pressure was fine the eye wash was closed then after two three days the pressure went up to 20. so we tried we decided to open a little bit and uh, open to four and then the pressure came down to about 10. after a few days pressure went up again so we decided to open more and we put the system on one pressure came down to eight. And then a day later, it was even lower at five again or six. So we said, maybe it's better to close a little bit. So we are closing the system to two and the pressure comes up to 10 and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are manipulating and usually this manipulation, we do a, a, a complete opening usually after one month. This is now our uh, global, study for the uh, CMARC study, which was done between 2015 and 2017. Uh, 143 patients were included uh, in different sites, mainly in Switzerland, but also in Greece and in, in London, Dr. Lim and Dr. O in Manchester. 
Uh, so uh, if you look the result of those 143 patients, the pressure, the mean pressure score was 26. It came to eight, nine the first week. And, and you can see that it slowly increased having a maximum at two months. And that is the phase when you get actually the cystic reaction in the orbits. Uh, and this is usually after one or two months. And then at that time, usually we treat patients with uh, uh, a beta blocker uh, or COSA, with a, a mixture of beta blocker and acetazolamide. And this we treat usually for six months. That is the cystic phase. And then after six months to one year, usually we can stop the medication. Some patients still need one drop at the long term, but you see that almost all the patients had three drops before surgery and a pressure of 26. Now they have a pressure of 12 with zero to one drop. So I personally, we never actually experienced because we could always close the system uh, if the pressure was a bit too low. The, uh, the success rate was 90% this is with or without therapy, and the complex, complete success rate without any medication was almost 40%. We compared those results with the Barfel tube. And you can see that in the Barfel tube, you have persistent hypotony in 4% of cases versus zero with the iWatch. And interestingly, even if the Barfel tube is actually bigger the plate than the iWatch, with more success rate, and that I don't understand. I don't have the reason, but you can see that if you look now the curve of pressure, the bar fell at a little bit higher pre of pressure uh, at 32 millimeters of mercury, but all along the study, the pressure remained higher because here the tube was closed, I mean, with some sutures, and the pressure was an average of about 20, but they, they were pressure of 30 and even 32 after one month. And all this period, and for those patients, those pressure are still dangerous. Whereas with the iWatch, we had a very low pressure and very regulated pressure. The pressure never exceeded 18, actually, in our series, in the post-operative follow-up. Now, comparing the number of medications, you can see that the baseline, the bar fell at three medication versus 2.8 for the iWatch. In the first period, you know, the eye washer didn't take any drops. Only the Barfell patients took drops. We started to put drops after one month due to that cystic reaction, as I told you before. I can see that the average drops was about one drop uh, for the first year. And then slowly we can decrease the number of drops, time going on. Whereas with the Barfell patient had to continue with one, one to point five drops per patient on a long term. This is a comparison study which was done by uh, Dr. Knistet in Zurich, comparing Ahmed implant and iWatch. And you can see that, uh, I'm sorry, but this is my slide is covered with your faces, but uh, uh, you can see that the success rate of the uh, iWatch is still better than the one of the Ahmed tube. And the complication rate of Ahmed tube are much higher compared to the iWatch uh, system. Now, concerning the cornea, these are uh, UBM of uh, uh, Barfel or I, uh, uh, Ahmed tube, which are flexible. The diameter is 0 0.63 millimeter. And the, in the studies, corneal endothelial cell loss was 12% for Ahmed and 13% for Barfel. In comparison with the iWatch, we also did we did study the endothelial cell loss. First of all, the tube is much smaller, 0 0.4, uh, 48, sorry, and the loss was 5%, which is the same loss as you get after FACO emulsification. So it's very much less, and we still had a few cases of corneal decompensation. That's what also you can get after cataract surgery. Uh, if you are careful, even if you are careful in your surgery. Now, what about uh, MRI scan? You know, we are implanting a magnet in the eye. So you can see on this MRI scan on the right eye, there is a little um, trouble on, on the result of the scan here because the, the eye wash makes some disturbance actually on the result of the MRI scan. 
but it's not dangerous after for the eye because it doesn't move at the eye wash. It can actually do uh, modify the opening. So we are always asking our patient if they need to do an MRI scan to come and make an adjustment of the eye wash system after the MRI scan. Concerning other magnets, such as in airport security, usually there is no interference and the patient can travel normally. Uh, in the daily situation, we are always telling the patient that they should not bring magnet very too close to their face, because the, any magnet, like the one you have on the fridge or any other magnet, may modify the aperture of the system. So this is basically what I wanted to say about this uh, new system, which is very useful. Now I'm only using this in my daily practice because it's really useful. Patients like it because they don't have any drop in visual acuity and uh, there are very few post-op complications. So on my side, I'm very positive, but of course, I'm, uh, I have a little bit of a, an, uh, an interest or conflict of interest because I was the inventor of the system. I don't have many shares in the company who is doing it, but still there is a little bit of conflict. And so I would not say the opposite, then it's good. But um, I'm sure other colleagues who have been trying it uh, might have uh, a few complications to share. Uh, myself, I had a few complications, as I said, uh, we had some corneal decompensation uh, because we did now big numbers, probably more than 300 cases. And uh, we, at the beginning, we had also some conjunctival erosion, which were now solved putting the uh, tutoplast patch. But because at the beginning we didn't put the patch, but now with the patch, we really are very happy with our result. So this is the end of this talk. And uh, I'm going now to go to my second talk. Oh, I don't know if you want to ask a question at that stage. Can we uh, carry on, uh, Professor Mahmoud? In the end, we'll take some questions. With my second question. talk. Yeah. The second talk will be done on deep spherectomy. And uh, so deep spherectomy was developed almost 30 years ago in Russia. Uh, in uh, late 80s, I had the, the luck, I can say, to discover this technique from a Professor Koslov in 94, just after my return from India when I was in Velo. And uh, I tried to the technique a little bit more and doing a lot of studies to try to understand what it means. So what are the advantages? The deep check for me this is a scheme showing that uh, um, you actually basically are creating an intrascleral bleb, which is shown here. And on the picture, you can see it here. And this is maintained with this implant, which is this collagen implant. Unfortunately, this implant doesn't exist anymore. So, but it was very useful at the beginning. And uh, now we are using viscoelastic, but this implant was much better. I'm so, uh, it really. Now the second advantage is, is that we are not opening the chamber. And as you can see here, there is a membrane. This is called trabeculo desmet membrane. You can see it here. From here to here, there is a, that membrane, which keeps the anterior chamber closed. The water will flow through the membrane at a regular resistance, because the membrane is basically the same in every patient. If you do it the same size, you know, usually it's four millimeters wide, and one, four millimeters wide and one millimeters long. So you can almost guarantee that the post-op pressure will always be around 10 millimeters of mercury. It varies between, I would say, five and 15, which are good pressures, you know. Um, in comparison, if you do a trab, you never know what will be your first deep pressure. Could be zero, could be 40. With deep pressure, you have a much better reliability uh, in your results because of that membrane. And the other advantage is that intrascular bleb, because this will give you an alternative to the subcontractual bleb. Doing a trial, you just have a subcontractual bleb and can be sometimes painful for the patient. It may even get infection or hypotony. With the deep spectrum, since we have the intrascular bleb, and we even get subcontractual bleb also, but much more subtle, subtle and people and patients don't feel them usually. So how do we create this? Here are four slides. The first slide, A, we do first a big flap, five by five millimeter, 
and uh, which is about one third of the sclerous thickness. Then we do the second flap, which is very deep, 95% of the sclerous thickness, leaving just a very thin layer of sclera at the end here. Uh, you can see that we are reaching Schlem's canal, that is the pigmented part is Schlem's canal, and then we go further to uncover the desmet window, I mean desmet membrane. So we go, slowly go with a knife, pressing over this desmet uh, membrane, and then dissecting it, and then cutting on every side to create this window. So here we're cutting on the side, and we are advancing to get about a one to two millimeters trabecular desmet window. I'm going to show you a video. This is the first flap. Usually we open the conjunctiva at the limbus. So this is a 300 micron thickness flap. We are doing the flap quite anterior into the cornea to be able to go to the desmet membrane later. So I just put some mitomas in. Now we're doing the second flap. Here, I just want to make a little stop. You can see that we are leaving that space here. It's like a step. And this is useful because uh, if you get a perforation, it's not a drama, if you, but then if you have a perforation, then there will be a lot of flow. So we are able to close very tightly on both sides, our first flap. And then in the poster part, we go uh, at the same level of, as the first flap so that the aqueous flow will occur in the poster part. So uh, continuing our dissection, here we're going down to the choroid. I like to expose the choroid to know my total thickness. Now this is the opening of Schlem's canal here. And then the other, on the other side also. It's very sophisticated ruby knife, but nowadays I don't use this anymore. I'm uh, pressing gently over the membrane to uh, detach the desmet from the cornea stroma. And then slowly we are cutting on the side. Here is a, just a regular 11 blade. And then we are cutting that second flap this will leave us with a nice trabecular met membrane here. See the trabecular is very pigmented. We're going to remove it here with the forceps to improve the outflow even through the posterior trabeculum. So this is the inner wall of Schlem's canal, which is the diseased part of the eye during glaucoma. Uh, okay, this is the collagen. That's old story. Unfortunately, we don't have this anymore. So I'm going to the next uh, video. This is the ILA flow, which is a reticulated hyaluronic acid, which will stay inside actually for three months. And that's very useful for that because it will remain there and really create a nice space inside the sclera. Here we have a little perforation. I put some just ordinary elon in the anterior chamber, but now I have to create some tamponade. So this is the ILA flow. This is the reticulated hyaluronic acid. And this will really create some resistance in the outflow and also create the intrascular blood. We are then closing the flap uh, using normally just two sutures, but if we have a perforation uh, at the membrane level, then I will put some two more suture on either side, you know, on the two side here and, and even in the back. So I'm putting a, a total of eight suture and then that will avoid hypotony post -oppressively. At the end, I'm re-injecting a little bit of ILA flow to be sure that the space is totally filled with this viscoelastic substance to create as much as possible an intrascleral bleb. We at the one stage, we did even a hole in the thin layer and injected ILA flow between the ciliary body and the sclera to create a subcorridal flow. And that was very interesting and uh, we did uh, UBM, and you can see it, it here. This is actually the intrascleral bleb here. This is the subconjunctival bleb. And here in black, you have the subchoroidal bleb. So there are three blebs, one, two, and three. And we come back to this later. Uh, this is to show you that if you don't do the correct this section, the surgery doesn't work. Here we are too much superficial and we didn't open Schlem's canal. So if we continue like this, we won't be successful. So now we're going deeper. And here we are reaching actually the desmet membrane. And now we are opening Schlem's canal. So if you persist being too superficial, then the pressure will never drop. And then your technical surgery will not be successful. 
Now, another problem is the next case here. It was a situation operated by one of my colleagues who came because uh, the pressure was good, well controlled for about a month, and then it went up again. And then when I did the gonioscopy, I couldn't see the trabeculismic window. So we reopened and then we found that actually the dissection was much too sh uh, short. You know, we have, as I told you, we have, this is Schlem's canal, but then we have to go much further. We have to expose the desmet membrane, which is anterior here, because here it will block the filtration. Uh, so what we did in this case, we continued, oh, sorry, uh, uh, coming back to that case. Yeah, so we reopened the old dissection and then we continued to open uh, the, to remove actually the corneal tissue and to expose the trabecular desmet membrane totally. And then you have to take a little bit of time and see that now actually it's filtering nicely, but we have to go further anteriorly. This is my latest surgery. It's a surgery done really, really recently, uh, maybe a few weeks ago. Now I don't have any more sophisticated instruments. So just I'm using an ordinary 15 blade and a crescent blade here to do my horizontal flap. And uh, that costs almost nothing. Um, and I, I wanted to show you this because in uh, some countries, the doctors can't afford to, to pay for expensive equipment. You can do it with very simple instrument. And here we, we're doing the second flap, same, leaving a little stair, step on either side. Now we are opening Schrems canal. You can see that the color of Schrems canal have to get the right uh, deepness. And that is by cutting radially, we can actually be sure to reach it directly. Here I'm separ separating the corneal stroma from the desmet and so are creating uh, the membrane. That is the most difficult part of the hysterectomy uh, because you can, you can perforate. But actually, if you perforate, it's not a problem because then you get almost like a trabeculectomy. You need to do an iridectomy and then to close your flap quite tightly. But then the results will be perfect because uh, we are using that technique, which what, what we call the penetrating hysterectomy in patients who cannot afford to come for follow-up visit. Uh, and so I have patients coming from Africa in Switzerland, then they will go and they will come back. They will not come back. And uh, if you do the regular deep stephanie, we have to do a gonia puncture uh, later on. So if patient doesn't come back, it's better to do actually a perforation, iridectomy, and then close tightly your flap. You still get your three ways of access resorption and just come back to this. So there are two major messages I want to give you today. One is that the filtration of aqueous between the anterior chamber and the intracellular blood is flowing through this membrane. This membrane is very important because it will allow you to avoid the post of complication. The membrane after one month is not any more useful. And if the pressure raises again, then just do a hole in the membrane with your YAG laser. If you don't have a YAG laser, if you, then in that case, it's better to open the membrane during surgery and put an extra six suture on your flap so that you avoid hypotomy. Now, the second advantage of this hypotomy over trabeculectomy that you create three to four uh, drainage system. One is the subconjunctival, as you can see here on the UBM. One is the intrascleral that you can see here. And I'll show you that it makes a blood there. And one is the subchoroidal. And then the fourth one can be Schlem's canal, which has been opened here on both sides. So this is a histology of a deep spectrum done on uh, some monkey eye, but it's the same anatomy as human. You can see the fourth trabeculum here with the Schlem's canal, then the anterior trabeculum, and then desmet membrane. So this is a trabecular desmet membrane. If you look at putting some color, you can see that the main filtration occurs actually through the anterior trabeculum. And if you remove the inner walls, then you can also get filtration through the posterior trabeculum. So this is nicely shown what happens through the membrane. If you're removing, as I just saw on the, on the video before, the inner wall, you are increasing your flow through the posterior trabeculum. 
just to show you, we did some electron microscopy on what we are removing. This was in normal eyes with no glaucoma. We had a few examples, and this is a normal endothelium with the vacuole water coming through here. The active transport between the trabeculum and the Schenz canal. And this is what we see in glucomatous patients, where you can see that the endothelium is totally amorphic. There is no more cells, there are no more vacuoles, so there is no transport between the trabeculum and the Schlenz canal. Now, that I want to show you is a study we did on a rabbit. This is the angle of a rabbit before surgery, and we are injecting uh, blue ferritin to color the pathway of aqueous. And you see the rabbit has a very important uvestular outflow. Some goes to the Schlem and some goes to the uvestular outflow here. Then we did a deep spectrometry with the collagen implant here. So the flow goes to the carbohydrated membrane and fills that space, intracellular space. Doesn't do a subconjunctival blend. After three months, the implant was resolved, but there is still flow going inside the sclera. And this is the intrascleral blade with that blue color. And interestingly, after nine months, you can see that the intrascleral blade has a lot of drainage vessels. You can see them here, those vessels with the endothelium here. You don't see any before, and you see plenty after. So this tissue inside the sclera is like a sponge and will resolve your aqueous after the surgery. And that's why it's very useful to do this technique for children. If you have congenital glaucoma, you create an intrascleral bleb. And even if there is no subconjunctival bleb, the pressure will be controlled in the great majority of your children patients. Again, to show the difference, before, no, no veins, aqueous drainage veins, after plenty of aqueous veins inside the sclera. Now, if we do UBM, uh, we can see that the intracellular blood can be found in almost 93% of our patients. And the volume of that blood is not uh, small, it's 1.8 millimeter cubic. This is the subcontract of blood. Usually we see a diffuse blood, but you don't, really don't see it very much. But it's there. If you do UBM, you can find a blood under the conjunctiva, but very diffuse, very well tolerated. There is no risk for late endophthalmitis or late hypotony usually with this technique. And then finally, uh, we observe in almost 50% of patients, the subchoroidal filtration and the C here, and you can see it on the UBM actually here or here, even more posteriorly. And this is an important way of access for resorption, especially in the two first year with time, we realize that these features are usually disappear after one to two years by doing regularly ultrasound in our patients. So to conclude, a deep spectrometry is a, a bit of more difficult technique, surgically speaking, compared to trabeculectomy. It takes a bit, maybe 10 minutes more to do the surgery, but as tremendous advantage in reducing your post-op complication, giving you a much more stable post-op pressure. It will also help your patient in the long term because uh, uh, it will give the patient not only a subcontract blood, but it will create an intracellular blood, which is much more comfortable and efficient for the patient. The mean pressure after 10 years is 11 millimeters of mercury to 12 millimeters of mercury. So it's very low. It's as low as in trabeculectomy, but we don't have those very big variations. You know that if you do trab, sometimes you have a pressure of two because the blood is very ischemic and sometimes you have still 20. Here, the pressure, the mean pressure is much more stable around 12 millimeters of mercury. But of course, as I already said, there is no perfect surgery. And even if we do deep spectrum, we have our uh, problems, we have our failures, but basically, Overall, we get very good results, and I'm very happy. Uh, having done that now this for 27 years, and I will never change. Uh, I will continue to do that uh, unless we find something better. So this is, I think, my last slide, and I'm saying thank you for your attention. It was really very nice to speak to you from Cameroon to India. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Andre Mabul. We really appreciate the fact that you've taken time out, even though you're in Cameroon and it's lunchtime, um, to bring to us a treat, really, for us to see your wonderful surgery. Uh, there are a few questions, of course, but uh, I'd invite uh, Dr. Pratip Vyas with his uh, impressions, comments, questions, if any. I yeah, uh, I don't very much, uh, Professor yeah. Andre. Hello. Please go on. Yeah, I'm it was, you know, you. it was, okay. It was a wonderful lecture and we learned a lot, uh, particularly the iWatch. Uh, it's a combination of our innovation of engineering with a good surgical skill. And uh, we, you, we always say that in glaucoma, every single millimeter counts. So with the surgery, it is not possible, but you have made it possible that every single millimeter yes, so it does count and you can uh, only, you know, it yeah, obviously I, must I'm be very expensive procedure. I don't uh, hear very well. Maybe you can repeat the question uh, uh, so that I can hear the question. Okay. So, you know, I was appreciating that, you know, how we can adjust the intraocular pressure. And what we say that every single millimeter counts in glaucoma. So really it is possible with the eye watch. Yes, you can adjust oh, yes. the pressure. But how long you can do that? But how long oh, you can do that? How long oh, it yeah. works? Yeah, usually it's useful for the first months. Because after one month, you created enough uh, outflow resistance inside the orbit. And usually the pressure is anyway around 10 millimeters of mercury. And then it will go even higher when you have the cystic reaction. So the iWatch advantage is mainly for the first post-operative month, uh, which is the most difficult part of the tube surgery follow-up time. You know, uh, Then in some very rare cases, we had hypotony uh, later, then we could close the tube a little bit, uh, even after two or three months. There are a few cases where there was not much uh, scarring reaction in the orbit. And then in those cases, when the pressure was too low, we could close the system again uh, and then reopen later. But normally we don't touch anymore the eye wash after one month. Okay. Any further questions, uh, Dr. Yes, Vanita, go ahead. Right, Professor. Uh, what we, what I, uh, you know, uh, get a few reactions here is about the length of the plate that is used, uh, which is uh, uh, probably much more than either an Ahmed valve or a bar weld. We, of course, don't get bar welt in India. We use the uh, the Indian equivalent, the uh, Orolab aqueous drainage implant, you may be aware. Uh, so uh, is there a danger that you may be going too far posterior, uh, you know, almost close to the uh, optic nerve, Any, uh, especially the 18.9 uh, 300 millimeter plate, if you're yeah, 15 millimeter behind the limbus? It's a, it's a very good question. Um, we never experienced problem on the optic nerve, such as you know reduction in visual field or, or pain or whatsoever. Um, the only thing we have uh, observed after the eye wash, which we didn't have with uh, Barfeld or Ahmed, was uh, macular cystic macular edema. And I cannot explain this complication so far. I thought it was maybe the shape and that long plate, but then we compared uh, with the 300 and the 200, the 200 is much smaller, and we had the same amount of uh, cystoid macular edema. And so now we are more trying to look in the material, uh, but the material is basically the same as the Barfeld uh, plate. But now maybe the, the material of the eye watch itself. So now we are studying this material, which is also a very old material used in cardiac implantation. So it's a, it's a well 
uh, uh, tolerated material, but it was not used in the eye. So that's why we're going to do maybe some studies to see if that is maybe the reason for those macular edema. But that is the only really worrying complication that, that we are getting in some cases. Uh, right. But as, as long as I, 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 I have really carefully looked at that, I don't think that the length actually is a problem. So can it be used in pediatric cases, especially your 200 millimeter squared ones? Yes. So you know what, what, what we do if we realize during the surgery that uh, the implant cannot be put 12 millimeters behind because there is some restriction, you know, in terms of ge geometry. What I'll do, I'll cut, actually I'll cut and I, re I reduce the size of the plate oh, in order okay. to be able to put it. So in a small child, you can use it. But uh, personally, I never used actually that in a very small child because usually what we do, we do a deep sclerectomy, trabeculectomy, uh, and this gives us good results in children's glaucoma. So I don't have experience with the eye watch. Right. No, I don't mean the very young ones, but you know, the ones who would cooperate at the slit lamp, uh, you know, maybe 10 years onwards or 12 years onwards when they are, uh, uh, when they cooperate well enough at, at yes. the slit lamp, but they use... You know, of course, in a child, it will be very difficult to adjust the, the system. Uh, you, you, you may need to do a, a GA. Uh, but yeah, if you have a six, seven years old child, you can, you, you, they can cooperate and you can do that easily because it's not painful to, to do that adjustation, you know, the adjustment. I, I often wondered, uh, you know, we, we talk about the hypertensive phase of the uh, drainage device. I mean, obviously it is uh, mostly uh, unavoidable, but whether you could actually keep the eye watch closed for a couple of weeks at least, treat the eye with the steroids to reduce the inflammation so that there are no inflammatory cytokines escaping towards the plate and whether that strategy could help to reduce the hypertensive phase. I don't know. I, I'm just, I, I just wonder. Well, you know, I, I don't think we get so many uh, cytokines in our aqueous drainage because uh, we don't really touch the inside of the eye. There is no iridectomy. Uh, basically, we're just sticking a needle, uh, not touching any tissue inside the eye. So there is almost no inflammation. And as I said, uh, there is uh, no effect on, of the vision. The vision is not affected by the surgery and the eyes are very quiet. Uh, so patient and they don't patient don't feel any pain afterwards. I do a retrobulbar anesthesia, and usually they don't. I mean, the, the retrobulbar anesthesia is enough to keep them quiet for the sixth hour, and then I never have complained. I mean, on on, on pain and on whatsoever. Then, uh, Professor Mahmoud, how how do you explain the occurrence of the if the eye is so quiet? How do we explain the occurrence of a hypertensive phase in uh, eye watch? Sorry, of, of what? Well, we normally assume that it's it's the inflammatory factors that reach the plate from day one in uh, uh, oh in, yeah yeah in hemoglobin valve, and that's why the chance of hypertensive phase is much higher yeah, compared yeah, yeah. to a non-valved uh, plate. So uh, that's what I wondered. I was questioning along those lines. Yeah, I, I strongly believe that all the reaction you get in the orbit and with the cystic phase is due to the aqueous, because aqueous is not something uh, very uh, accepted by the body. I mean, you can see if you have a sidle, mm -hmm. then the conjunctiva becomes almost necrotic and the cornea doesn't like so the aqueous humor is not something good actually for other tissue. Mm -hmm. And I think when you bring aqueous, even if there is no inflammation inside, mm -hmm. it's actually a foreign body we are putting in the orbit. Okay. And the natural reaction is to make a wall and to try to avoid that liquid to be there. So right. the, the cystic reaction actually is just a, a foreign body reaction that we get, uh, what, uh, even if there is no inflammation in, in the liquid. Right, right, right. Okay. And one very interesting question, Professor Mahmoud. Do you do traps at all nowadays? And actually, no. What I do, I do deep scarectomy 
with a perforation. I do many of those, uh -huh. which are like a, a TWAB plus a deep sacrament. It's actually the combination of the two surgery. And as I said, this gives you excellent results because you have all the combination. Uh, you don't need to do a gonio puncture later. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have iris collapse because sometimes in deep spectomy, if the patient is doing a valsalva phenomenon or as a trauma, you might have a iris prolapse through the membrane. Mm -hmm. And if you do a neuridectomy, you don't have this complication neither. So mm -hmm. I think uh, if you have old patient, uh, deep spectomy is good. But if, even if you have a young patient, uh, even in Switzerland, I can follow him carefully. My young patients are doing physical efforts, doing Valsalva. I prefer to actually open it and do a, a combined a deep spectrum with trabeculectomy. Right, right, okay. Uh, you know, you said that the collagen wick that used to be available uh, is, uh, is, has been discontinued. Uh, could uh, Ologen be a, a, a substitute there? Could uh, could you use an yes. Ologen there? I, I I tried the Ologen. I tried the Ologen, uh, but it was not as as nice as the collagen. Uh -huh. And now then I tried the Ila Flow as I showed on the video, and yeah. the Ila Flow gives us the best results. With okay. the Ologen, we still had some fibrosis reaction. With some closure of the whole system. That's why personally I don't use the halogen, but I know that some colleagues are still using it. Helaflow does not uh, give resistance. I mean, you fill it with Helaflow, I see. Uh, does it not give uh, resistance in the early phase and uh, keep the pressure high? Well, it can if you are closing very tightly the flap. Okay. Uh, then Sometimes you have some resistance, but it's never more than 20. I never had pressure over 20. Uh, so usually what we do, we just wait one or two days, three days maximum, and then the pressure comes down between 10 and 15. Oh, okay. So usually there is no, not really a problem. But how do we know that Helaflow is actually uh, present for three months and does not disappear? Oh, this we did study uh, on animals. Okay. And we also did in humans UBM okay. because uh, we could see actually the, uh, the, the, the nice bleb inside the sclera. And then when the ILA flow goes, the bleb becomes a bit smaller. So, okay. but that's uh, our hypothesis, you know? I mean, we don't have definite uh, right. proof of that. Right, right, right. Well, and is, is the uh, one last question is the iWatch freely available throughout, or, you know, is it just. Uh... Uh, available in certain parts of the world? I mean, I know it, it's uh, not available in India for sure, but... Um... <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I, I know that iWatch was registered at the C mark about yes, yes. two years ago. Yep. It was just, just before the COVID. Yes. And uh, of course, the little company, the startup company, uh, they could not do much publicity with the COVID uh, crisis. But it's available on, in principle around the world, except in the US. So they still need to do a US study to be FDA approval. Right. But I think it should be available in India. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Professor Man Mamu, we really enjoyed the session, not only seeing your wonderful surgery, but also interacting with you personally. We have learned so much, so, so much oh, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> about deep sclerectomy as well as I watch. Uh, this, with your talk, culminates, a, you know, the uh, brings to an end the glaucoma module in our current series. So we are sad, but we are very happy that we got to meet you finally. Yes. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, you for know, your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure yeah. to be with you for this hour. Thank and you so much. One, uh, one more time if you need me. <laughs> yeah, any, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I know you are traveling, but yet you manage this talk, one hour talk. During your okay. life. Bye bye. Thank you so much. You. And before bye -bye. we conclude, I want to profusely thank Vanita for very patiently moderating all the 52 sessions that is for six months. Prateep for uh, course uh, chairing it and Dr. Harsh, of course, for chairing it. And it was a very interesting time that we had for six months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanita. Thank you, Prateep. Thank you. Always Dr. a pleasure.
Thank you, Santosh. We have learned a lot and we learned a lot. <laughs> it was a great learning. <laughs> we will miss it now. <laughs> we'll again have it. I mean, it's cyclical. We'll move on oh, to retina modules. Let Marina attend the retina session. <laughs> she won't miss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Thank, much. You. Thank you. Thank Good you, night. Bye. Good Thank you, Vanita. Bye. Au revoir from the glaucoma team. Au <laughs> revoir <laughs> from the glaucoma team. Great. Thank you.